soccer jitsu. So we're super excited to have them here. And so we have Hollis. She is going to be our moderator. She is the CEO of Benevolent Valkyrie. Did I say that right? Benevolent Valkyrie, yes. Heck yeah, Benevolent Valkyrie. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Susan Marcos. for that wonderful introduction. Um, we are members of the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. Um, we are here to empower and help women in the cybersecurity field. And so today we wanted to do sort of a little Rosie the Riveter theme and talk to our, our guests, um, Edith, Susan, and Geneva, and you'll find out what their journeys have been like because we're all at a different kind of journey age stage. Um, Susan, I'm going to hit you up for the first question. Well, all right. No um, pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all, right. Um, what inspired you to get into a career of cybersecurity? Yeah, so I was trying to explore um, different careers because I've been in finance, education, and it just didn't feel right. So as I was learning about different technology, I um, kind of found my passion in, or my interest in cybersecurity. And one of the cool things as I was going through my cybersecurity boot camp was it reminded me of my father who passed away in 2016. And you know, I remember all the passwords, you know, crazy. His passwords were ridiculous. But now, being in cybersecurity, I understand why. So it's been fun as, a, as the journey keeps going. You know, I get to see my father and like the things that he already was doing previously. Um, and when I talk to different people, right, one of the things they mentioned is that they all kind of fell into cybersecurity, but they're all doing it. So uh, it's, it's, it's been a really great ride, and um, I'm getting to know more, and I'm still a newbie, so be nice. <laughs> Uh, Geneva, do you have anything you can add with that? What inspired you? Um, I've kind of always wanted to be in uh, tech. Uh, when I left high school, I joined the Marine Corps. I did radio communications. I got out. Still didn't know how to get in tech. I didn't have anybody to like guide me over there. Uh, so I did law enforcement. <laughs> and then once I decided I was done with law enforcement for my three kids, um, I found the Vet Tech program, which is Veterans in Technology. And I did a cybersecurity boot camp. And then I felt like I just didn't know foundational skills. So I found NPower, and through NPower, I was able to get some foundational experience. And they led me to AFS and to a Society of Cyber Jitsu for Women. Um, and then I was able to get into Accenture Federal Services, and now I do uh, user management. So, okay. so my story is not dissimilar. I actually am. Graduated from a local high school, Edison, so SAISD, inner city kid. Okay. Um, and, then, <laughs> so, um, and then I went to uh, Texas a and University. I actually graduated with a degree in economics. So always interested in the numbers and STEM, um, but really wasn't sure what was what was out there, really. And so I kind of fell into economics. I really, I, I liked it. I feel like, much like uh, cyber, economics is a huge driving factor to our society. Um, and so that was what interested me in economics. And um, what didn't interest me was the very, um, and, and I say this because it's not good for me, not because it's not good in general. Um, it was a very um, rote job. I 
went in at a certain time. I knew exactly what I was going to do every single day, and I went home at the same time every day. Like, the only question every day was what we're going to have for lunch. <laughs> right? That was, like, the, our biggest stress, biggest pressure. Um, and so, like, it's definitely um, something that is not a good fit for my personality. Um, and so after I was there for maybe a year, a year and a half, um, I was like, I need something to push me in a different direction. So I actually joined uh, the Navy. I did eight years active duty in uh, Navy Intel. And that was kind of where I transitioned a lot of, in the DOD, um, it's sort of uh, electronic warfare. Right, so it's it's everything, the whole spectrum, and so we touched on cyber, we touched on different things, and um, when I was in the military, is when I learned about uh, you know data and all the data that comes from the massive amount of data that comes from from cyber, and I kind of transitioned into cyber that way. That was really long. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys sound like you all had distinct different journeys and you've all ended up at the same place which is wonderful um edith uh, how would you encourage more young women and girls to pursue careers in cybersecurity? yeah so that's a that's a really good question um i think that for our young people sometimes we kind of lock them in um, we, we're like, hey, you're 17 or 18. The decision you make now will affect the next like 40 years of your life. No pressure, guys. Like, just no pressure. Um, and I think helping uh, young people understand how broad cyber can be. Like, I look at some of my colleagues, right? And so we've got people who focus on the finance of cyber. We have people who focus on the law enforcement of cyber. Um, the marketing and graphics that serve cyber capabilities. It, you, it doesn't have to be one thing. Like you don't, you know, when I, when I talk to young people, when I approach them, I'm, just, I'm not like, hey, if you are not a hacker who can hack like NSA, then just like don't even bother. Like they, it's just the wrong uh, kind of perspective to bring. It is, does the realm of cyber interest you? Bring the other things that interest you and your other strengths and bring them all to cyber because I can almost 100% guarantee you we need you in the field. Right? It's it's not just one thing to do. It's not like defensive cyber or offensive, whatever it may be. Um, it's it's everything and everybody has a place. Jenny, would you like to expand on that? You're um, next, Susan. So yes. just be. <laughs> I would just like to say. Um, I tell everybody, um, whether you're female or male or whatever, even my young children, I have all boys, thankfully, because uh, I don't know what I would do with the girl. <laughs> um, that just because you think you can't doesn't mean you can't. Uh, always try. Um, like, we all have different skills, um, different abilities. And like she said, there's a cybersecurity is a vast realm, and like you can bring any skill to it and make it useful. Uh, you just got to know your strengths and how to use them and keep moving forward. Yeah, like having an open mind and I've, you know, I've met so many people that were from different industries, like you know, band directors are coming into cybersecurity, but they're able to use the skills as a band director and translate it into getting into cybersecurity field. So just be open and um, looking at different resources, kind of figuring out where do I fit or what skills specifically if um, you know, you're a puzzle solver, maybe pen testing might be like a good feel for you to go into. So just try to figure out um, and learning about all the different opportunities and the areas you can go into. Um, Geneva, I'm going to start with you on this one. <laughs> um, in your experience, what are some effective strategies for promoting diversity and inclusion in the cybersecurity industry? I would say some effective ways are just approaching it with an open mind. Um, I've always been in male-dominated careers, but I've never let that deter me. Um, the Marine Corps, male-dominated, law enforcement, male-dominated, even cyber we see is male-dominated for the most part. But, you know, we're all pivoting and making our way into the role and making names for ourselves. So never think that you can't. Uh, always be open-minded, open to communicate, open to 
talk to everybody and understand that we are all different, but at the same time, we can all bring different ideas and perspectives to the team that ultimately make us better, and we can all achieve the same goal together. <laughs> Susan? Um, come back to me, please. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. I got lost. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think um, with regard to diversity, both women um, or, you know, just across the entire uh, society, right, I think what I've seen in my experience is this, um, this idea that there is a, a path. Right, like must graduate high school, must graduate college, must uh, have like 10 years of experience by the time you graduate college with, you know, 10 certifications. Like there's like this, this path and, and I think for a lot of people, they feel if they don't, if they haven't met that ideal path or that um, got to know somebody kind of thing that there's just 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 no no way so why even bother and i think for uh, really all of uh, anyone who has any interest in cyber or bringing people into cyber understanding that there is there is no path we've made it up in our minds there is really no path right you talk to somebody and everyone got here in a different way um, there is a ideal or idealized path but there is no um, hard and fast way to get here and I think letting someone know hey you've been you know doing something else and you're interested in this like take it and, and I promise you guys I'm not I'm not affiliated but take a Udemy course right <laughs> like take uh, something for free and see if you like it and if and at the end of that you know 12 hours that you've invested if you were like wow that was really fun take another course and before you know it you've got like a micro degree or, or d different things like that and and you've already started your path into cyber without knowing it right so for me that's what I tell anybody across you know all of society if this is interesting to you you don't have to have like a hundred twenty thousand dollar degree like as long as you have a public library with internet you got a path to get there so that's that's kind of how I view us bringing down the barrier you just have to you know approach people who are interested that way instead of being like oh do you have a degree like what is your it doesn't matter half the people I've met don't have degrees so and before I hit you up Susan the Women Society of Cyber Jitsu table downstairs right across from registration. We do have a QR code there that are free resources for um, anyone trying to get into it. Or <laughs> so if you want to run down there and like scan the code, um, it, it, Diana Orozco, she uh, did a great job putting that together. So she's a wonderful person. All right, Susan, do you feel like answering? Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking along the lines like exposure, right? The more people are aware of cybersecurity, what it entails, the more interest. You know, that's how you bring diversity. And then also, like Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, it's an organization <coughs> dedicated to, you know, informing uh, specifically, you know, young girls and women, but just bringing out the exposure to cybersecurity. That's how you're going to get more diverse people. So finding out different resources or organization, going to something like B-Sides, you know, just putting yourself out there, that's how you're going to learn, and that will help you determine where you want to go. Um, so I think I want to follow that up with, um, what are some emerging trends uh, that you guys have seen for opportunities for women in cybersecurity? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller, anyone? I see like AI, cloud computing in that area, but I can't speak too much to it, but that's what I... <laughs> Why, why do you say that? Well, you know, artificial intelligence, there, it's, all, it's growing and there's a lot happening, right? So it's going at a fast pace. So that's where, you know, as a cybersecurity, you know, there's so much vulnerabilities and things that we have to get ahead of and be able to um, be preventative than be, um, uh, you know, defensive, I should say. And even cloud, right? It's been just growing and technology goes at such a fast pace that sometimes it, it is hard to keep up with it. But um, I feel like that would be somewhere women or any, any like underrepresented group can kind of get their beginnings, get that foundation, and then make waves in those areas specifically so that when uh, we can eventually be somewhat caught up. We can never be 100% caught up, right? 
Excellent. Thank you. Geneva? Yeah, and to add to that, um, there are a lot of resources, uh, like she said, for women, women in coding. Um, then you have women in cyber jitsu again, uh, you know, providing these free resources to, to help with the trend of getting, you know, women, young adults into cybersecurity. So I just think if people are more aware of what resources are available and um, the opportunities, there will be a, a bigger uh, pool of women joining into cyber. Um, so, so from my perspective, um, the one of the primary ways that women are distinct in the workforce is um, we're moms. Right, like I mean, we tend to be the primary, uh, what I call default parent. Um, you know, when when the baby cries, dad's gonna come in and it's probably gonna want mom, right? Like it's just it just is what it is, right? Um, and so, from that perspective, the the trend I see that is helping bring women into the industry is remote work. Um, like school drop off, you know, daycare drop off, doctor's appointments, all of that stuff. If I can um, stop what I'm doing, go real quick to the doctor, come back and, and pick back up, I didn't lose five hours from my day, right? Driving from work to the school to the doctor's office back. The um, industry's continued desire to embrace remote work I think will only continue to help that right it, it allows for more of us as a society to have a work-life balance which in my perspective directly impacts women in in one in all industry but specifically for this for our conversation women in cybersecurity and so with you know embracing that hey come to work when you need to be at work but don't come to work to sit by yourself in a cubicle. Like, what, what, you know, and, and like at the end of the day, I can stop and then run and start getting dinner. It's not an hour, an hour and a half drive home. Things like that. So from my perspective, remote work, um, embracing more of a work-life balance, I think will continue to allow women um, the the idea that there's space for them, that they can move into the fields, more technical fields, and that they can have success. Excellent. Yeah, I think, thank you, COVID-19. <laughs> not, not quite sure about that one. Um, Kent, I, I'm, I'm gonna hit everybody with this one, but uh, um, can you like describe like a funny story or memory or something um, on your career uh, journey that may have been either like a turning point or it, it it let you know that that's where you wanted to go. Funny, funny bottom line, funny stories here. If you have them, okay. if you have them. <laughs> I don't know about funny, uh, but I did work as an investigator, and every time people had computer issues or anything like that, they'd be like, "Geneva, help us," and I'm like. Uh, <laughs> What makes you think I'm that smart? <laughs> and they're like, you always figure stuff out. I was like, yeah, because I don't like to be stuck. Because <laughs> what we do is we carry our books, our um, our computers with us, and if anything went down, you know, it was up to you to figure out, hey, why is my computer malfunctioning, not working? Because uh, I would have to take it everywhere, all around Bear County. So I'd be like, oh, okay, I think this is it. And I just mess with the computer until I got it to work. So I was kind of known as like the little tech nerd for the investigators, and I'm like, that's not cool, guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not cool at all, but I, I like helping, and I still get to help, and now I'm doing it, and I love what I do, so that's that's my little funny, somewhat joke. <laughs> um, so, so mine was, um, I was in sort of analytic, analytics, kind of analytic discovery kind of field, right, and I... Um, whether perceived or real, I felt myself stuck. I was like, we've got a lot of technology coming, we've got AI who's gonna do a lot of this work for us, so we're gonna do like automatic processing of data, and I, and I feel like I'm a little stuck, right? So I actually um, 
was looking into uh, Coursera at the time at home and I was because I was like I can't I can't deal with degree right now like I just can't and so I was looking into Coursera different courses things like that um, and I that's where I fell into data science they had like these um, this program that's provided by Johns Hopkins they have like Python courses little things like that for you to explore Python for everyone if you haven't taken it it's amazing um, and so I was sitting there um, at home going through this like Python course for data science and my boyfriend at the time walked in and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm taking this uh, course because I, I think I'm interested in data science so I want to you know, pivot that way and he said, you can't do that. <laughs> Guys, like there, I flipped and I was like, yeah, I was like, oh man, I'm not going to go to sleep until this is done. It's going to be like 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm still going to be hammering this thing out, I promise. Like, it's not going to. And so um, he didn't, like, and it was funny because we talked about it afterwards. He didn't mean it that way. He was just like, at the time in our field, data science was just like such a daunting thing. Like, if you didn't actually go to Johns Hopkins and have a degree in data science, like, good luck, right? It was just like, it was, uh, the barrier to entering that field was so high at the time that when I was like, hey, I'm going to take this course at home from this like online program that I pay like $35 for, he's like, you can't do that, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily on me, but in my mind, it just kind of, I was like, well, now I have to show him <laughs> how he's wrong. <laughs> I, I take it he's not your boyfriend anymore. Oh, no, he still is. He oh, still okay. is. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, he, yeah, right. Yeah, he's a, uh, yeah. So uh, afterwards, he was like, wow, that was really, you know, impressive. And I, you know, we talked about it, but he was, and I totally understood him, but for, even if it was subconscious, like that clicked, and I was like, well, I have to make this a life goal now. <laughs> so that's my funny story. Susan? For me, I guess I've always kind of been interested in computers. Like, curiosity um, is one of the things that gets the strong skill for me. And I, you know, I've dabbled in different types of coding, but coding gets me really frustrated. <laughs> because it's just that one comma that could potentially like ruin the whole code and I just want to throw my computer out. So I'm like, you know what, maybe this is, this is not for me. So I, you know, I've done a little bit of data analyst uh, course. I've done project management. And when I got into cybersecurity, with, especially with the ID access management, I just felt like at home, at home. And like I said earlier, it kind of reminded me a lot of my dad. So it's kind of like a connection to him. So it's like he's with me here. A funny story, not necessarily related to career, but um, being a cybersecurity person, right? Like, you know, the strong passwords and everything, but people around you, they don't understand. So my husband, like, for the longest time, his passwords were really simple and the same, and I'm like, dude, come on. Like, your wife is in cybersecurity. You can't just have, like, you know, simple passwords. So, good news, guys. He's finally using long passwords, complicated passwords. So, yeah. Yay! It can be done. Yes. <laughs> Start with your family first. <laughs> Um, what advice would you guys give to women starting out in the cybersecurity field? I say network, and you probably hear this a lot, but networking is how I got my current internship. It's just talking to people that are in maybe a potential field that you're interested in. LinkedIn is a great well, uh, source. F finding people in different um, roles or companies that you want to work for, schedule an informal interview with them and just ask them, like, you know, what do you do? Like, what do you like about it? You know, if I want to be in that role, what what should I do? That will kind of help you, guide you, as you figure out where you want to be. But it, they're also a great source to kind of help you get that foot in the um, in the door. So networking is going to be one of your best bets. And then utilize all the resources. You know, there are a lot of free resources. And I'll be honest, I'm guilty of not using all of them, but that's something I'm working on. But yeah, there's so many free resources. Google, Google has, I mean, Coursera. They have certifications, um, Udemy. Uh, there's uh, there's a few others that you can you know to practice what you learn. Um, so just use your resources and network, and that will kind of help you guide your path. What she said. <laughs> Also, um, seek mentorship in the industry. Uh, look for uh, women in leadership roles, women in cyber. Um, just kind of pick their brains, see what they can offer you. Uh, and like she said, you still got to figure out what you want to do if you don't know. Um, so it doesn't hurt to 
to shadow somebody, to find somebody to mentor you, um, and again, look for your resources. Um, there's always opportunity, you just gotta find it, and uh, women are good at investigating and finding stuff, so do your due diligence and get out there. <laughs> and not only just women, right? There, because sometimes you're not gonna find that, so there are men that do wanna help out and is waiting for somebody to ask for, uh, to mentor them. So, you know, seek out anybody that you feel like could, you know, help you reach that goal. I promise I love you guys, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I 100% agree. Um, um, networking is important. You know, what I tell um, anyone who comes in to my team, and I, and I really feel that this is a case for everyone, is that when they come into a new role, they should identify three people, right? That first one is your person who is like your first line manager, right? The person you report to every day who kind of helps guide you through your day-to-day -day job. That second person is is your mentor, right? You identify that person, whether male, female, in your job, outside of your job, whoever it is that you want to kind of emulate as you go through your career. And the third person is not necessarily someone that you find. Like, you don't go find them and say, do you, do you want to be this person for me? It's sort of a unspoken and then later spoken contract in, in my view and that's your advocate right so they are almost never the same three people um, and so you find someone who recognizes the capability the capacity the interests in you and they're gonna throw your name out when opportunities come up the reason we call it a contract is because if they throw your name out and you constantly say no, they're gonna find someone else, right? So you have to kind of be open to recognizing that person and notice that that person is not putting your name forward because they hate you and wanna give you more work. Like that's, that's not what they're trying to do, right? It's military. Yeah, that's military. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're told, yeah, they are, they are, they, they notice that, you know, you're, you're trying really hard and they have um, sort of an unspoken trust or faith in you that if they put your name forward, you're going to do a good job, right? You're going to take it on, you're going to succeed. And so, you know, kind of recognize that person and then when you, when you establish that sort of relationship, then you do need to have that conversation, right? Because you can't take on like 20 things, right? And never sleep. And so kind of have that conversation, like this is kind of where I want to go. And, you, and, they, and they become your advocate. So recognizing that person early um, when you come into a space is important. Um, the other thing for, for women, and y'all please don't hate me, don't come at me. I, I, but, um, in, in my career and through my life, I felt that one of the things that we need to do better at, and we need to do better at teaching our young women, is confidence. Confidence in, in general, but confidence in very um, technical or male-dominated industries. Like, I feel like, for some reason, we, we feel like we're walking around with imposter syndrome, right? Like, we're just, like, we, like, we're here, but tomorrow someone's gonna find out I shouldn't be here, I'm gonna get fired, right? Like, why? Right, we're, we're, we were given an opportunity and we're here because we have capabilities and qualities and we can succeed and do well. And we need to carry that confidence with us into, into every situation, right? When we're talking to our mentees, when we're talking to young women um, you know, in high school who are trying to figure out what they wanna do, when, we're t when we walk into a boardroom and we're talking to our superiors, like, you, you belong there. Like, you didn't just accidentally happen in there or, you know, someone made a mistake, you belong there, and you, we have to remember to carry that with us when we have those discussions. That was really good. Um, so I think the next question, in, in your current roles, are you facing, other than the confidence, um, are you guys, do you guys, have you faced any um, like challenges or, or opportunities, and, and how did you respond to them? Uh, I'd say I'm an open door. Um, 
anything that I feel like will present an opportunity opportunity to me, whether I know I can do it or not, or if I know I have to go, you know, figure out how to do it. Um, I like to jump on that chance, that opportunity. Um, like she said earlier, I always use it as a foot in the door, a foot going forward, a foot moving to where I want to get. Um, so I will be up front and tell the person, like, um, I don't know if I know exactly how to do this, but I will figure it out and I will do it, like, the best that I can. And um, so far that's worked really well for me. <laughs> and it continues to work really well for me. So uh, that's what I kind of do, um, especially being new to the company that I work with. Um, I don't have actual uh, hands-on experience. I have training experience, but everything that's led me to this point has done me well. And um, I, even on my team, um, I have a senior above me who's kind of like took me under his wing and let me shadow him and work with him because he loves that. I'm always asking questions that I want to learn, that I want to do it, and that I'm like willing to fail to succeed. So, yeah, I would say for me, um, just coming into my new job as an intern, kind of new to the whole cybersecurity world, and then my manager and my team trusting me to actually train incoming contractors and interns, because I don't, I have the imposter syndrome. I'm, you know, I always have. Even just being here, I'll be honest, I was dealing with that all, fighting with that, but I had a great woman just kind of encouraging me to be here. But um, yeah, just the fact that they trust me now, that they believe that I'm capable and I know what I'm doing to um, just let the rain, because I, I didn't have, you know, it wasn't something that was set in place. It was just kind of like, my, this person's gonna start Monday. <laughs> Trade them, you know, and so I had to kind of come up with like ways to figure out, you know, where should I start, how should I do it, and it's been a fun, fun journey for me. I, I like, I realized that I like training and talking, so. <laughs> um, and I like making jokes too. Um, so, f so for me, and and I'm sure that you know anyone who's been in their career for for a little while has experienced this. So. <clears throat> I feel like uh, throughout our lives we have chapters in our career, like a point when we pivot, we take on a new role or a, a new job or we move or have a significant life event or you know th things like that. Um, and so I was in the uh, middle of a, of a big one. Um, I moved from Central Maryland, D.C. area where everything is like extremely chaotic. No one ever sleeps. Um, even when you go to like happy hour, you're still in business mode. You're still like, I, th that was the first time in my life when I moved over there where like as soon as I met a person, I was like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. The questions that came were like I was in a job interview or like, like I felt like I just had to print out my resume and be like, here you go. Can I go eat some tapas real quick <laughs> before we do this? Like I'm kind of hungry. Um, it, it was, it's just a very, very different environment. Um, <clears throat> And I moved to San Antonio. I stayed with my company, but I was taking on a very different role, working with very different uh, uh, coworkers, just different environment, different client space, just everything was different. Um, and and I, the first maybe three months, I was like, oh crap, what did I do? <laughs> like, maybe this was a mistake. Um, and so I saw that as like, you know, a, a very difficult situation. Um, but I kind of turned it around because what I realized was that, um, and I promise you guys I'm not talking bad about anybody at my firm, um, was that oftentimes within certain communities or within certain spaces, the people get very uh, comfortable, right? They. Um, they know how everything goes. They know they. It's just very routine, very uh, comfortable for them. And so when I came, I turned that very uncomfortable situation for me into an opportunity to be like, "Look, guys, there's other ways of doing this. Like, let's let's try this. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, I promise I'll go sit down and won't bother you guys anymore, and I'll figure something else out. But if it works, then it works. Like." What do we have to lose, right? And so I definitely turned what what could have been like me essentially shutting down and taking a step back in my career to me taking it as an opportunity to move forward, expand my network, expand uh, my visibility, expand my um, opportunities in what I was leading, um, and just a, a big step forward in my career instead of a step back. Excellent. 
Um, it looks like we're kind of getting close, so I'm going to throw out one last, one last question. Um, what would you, what advice would you give to someone trying to get into the cybersecurity arena? That, you know, like how do you network, or you know, what kind of nugget can you give to share? Like we mentioned earlier, like, you know, in LinkedIn, finding those, um, you know, just looking up people and just a really brief message, right? Like, hey, I saw um, you work at this place, you're doing this, uh, you know, I, I would be interested to get to know more, you know, can, do you have some like, 15 minutes to chat? And that could kind of lead the conversation in different ways. Uh, another way I would say is um, finding out just different networking events. So like the Chamber of San Antonio would have events where you might, it's not necessarily geared towards cybersecurity, but it is an event and you know there are people coming from different backgrounds and that's how, honestly, how I got to the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu is I went to a, just a local uh, business networking event. I met somebody there and she knew some uh, people in IT and cybersecurity. She knew that I was interested and I was trying to uh, make my way there. And so she told me about an event that was hosted um, at the tech port and I went to that which is where I met somebody else who I was like, hey, you know, I'm in this new field. I'm trying to, you know, get to know people. And so I connected with her on LinkedIn. And then she shared with me the kickoff event for Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. And I went and I was just, I felt really energized. And that's why I joined that group. So it, it's really like, take every opportunity that is um, given or seek out the opportunities. And you, you never know where it leads you. So um, just take a step forward. Um. And so, I know. <laughs> so, despite the fact that I'm sitting up here and I'm having, you know, this conversation with all of you in this room, um, so this is my advice for the introverts. I'm an introvert. I will probably go home and need a nap after this. <laughs> um, and I, I find uh, that a lot of people who are looking, who are in cybersecurity or looking to transition into cybersecurity, are usually introverts. Um, so two, two pieces of advice. Um, one, um, schedule the nap. You're, like you're gonna, you're gonna need it. Just schedule it ahead of time, right? Just. Um, and two, practice. Um, you know, we we often look at people and we're like, man, I, I wish I could I could be like that person. This is like 15 years of me practicing how to to get out of my comfort zone to be. To do those presentations to the board, to you know senior leadership, to uh, you know feel like I'm going to throw up before I go on the stage, like all like I, it's all practice. It, it, it's not one of those things for a lot of us that we um, are just naturally good on, and we're on, and we're good, and like it. It doesn't have to be natural, much like any other uh, skill that you have in your toolbox you have to sharpen it and hone it. And don't be afraid to like go to a conference and walk up to a random person and be like, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. Like one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna make a new friend or you're gonna find out that person was rude and you don't wanna talk to them anyway. Like we got nothing to lose, right? Very good advice. So that's my advice. Uh, on that note and uh, talking to somebody if you don't know how or don't feel comfortable going up to somebody, a compliment or a joke usually works. Um, <laughs> That usually works for me because uh, I usually don't know how to approach people without feeling awkward because I'm an introvert myself, believe it or not. It's a lot of practice. <laughs> and I actually I actually teach at the college too, so I'll go figure. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be my advice too. Uh, just network, talk to people. Uh, you never know what people will tell you or what information they share or they could be that next person who advocates for you because they know the skills and the abilities that you have. Excellent. Um, any questions for any of our panel? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is a great panel, and thank you for talking about imposter syndrome, because I think throughout the cybersecurity arena, a male, woman, minor, whatever your bucket is, because it's an ever-changing field, everybody has imposter syndrome, you shouldn't feel bad about it. Yep. Um, the, other, the other thing I just want to mention and uh, ask if you, and if you are doing this is, um, if you're in a corporate setting and, and a large corporation, especially when you're on a team, whomever that manager is, they have a budget that renews at some point, time to out 
with that budget renews, a month before the budget renews, go, do you have any year-end money left? And create yourself a project so that you can advance in your career field. And that would be the one thing that I would say is really important to do to drive yourself to always learn new things and try things you don't understand. No, 100%. I 100% agree. Um, and for, to, to your point, for many of you guys who are, who may not be in that spot yet, but are looking to, to be there for, at least for Booz Allen, we have um, money that is set aside yearly for what we call strategic investment or projects, right? So if you have like a really cool idea and you just don't have time to work on that, the idea is that that pot of money is set aside for time, right? Because, I mean, if you don't know it, time is money, right? <laughs> time, time is money. So if if you were, you know, working on another project, you just can't find the time to do this at home, whatever it is, they will provide you those hours, 100 hours, 160 hours, to explore uh, this project, this idea, and it's very much like Shark Tank. You you put together sort of this idea, you pitch it, and they're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. We have a need for that. We will fund you, your project. At the end of it, you present it, and if if you've done a good job, they will give you more money. And, and the, really, the sky's the limit with something like that, right? You just kind of keep going. Um, a point being that a lot of corporate people, a lot of corporate entities have that type of program. So if you are the tinker type, if you have these really great ideas, that, you know, innovative and entrepreneurial and inventive, like, don't feel like once you're in the corporate world, like, that's it. You're just like a nine to five drone. Like, there's lots of, <laughs> there's lots of opportunities even within large corporations. Excellent. Well, I want to thank um, Edith and Susan and Geneva for being up here and participating in the panel. Um, I'm going to do my random plug for uh, what? Oh, oh, yes. Um, St. Mary's, or actually. Cyber Jitsu, yeah, sorry. Cyber Jitsu is actually sponsoring a Cyber Patriot camp. The what is where the July 22nd through 26th. If you're interested, um, basically see anybody with one of these. Yeah, or those two, basically, <laughs> those two. Um, and they can help you. Um, and sort of in that networking frame as well. Um, if you're interested in, you know, talking with someone for Cyber Jitsu, again, look at this. Um, and, you know, this is a way to build your network because um, you're meeting people you might not know and as you get to know them. So there's a lot of opportunity out there um, and we're very grateful that you all sat and listened. And if you have any questions or anything, you can just come up right now, hand, hand clap for the panel. Some of you might have 